guests who are going to share some knowledge with us. And I love it when this happens, you know, when it's not just, you know, me sharing what I know or think I know, but everybody's sort of contributing. So we have, we have Bruno and Alex, and I guess maybe if you guys want to just both say hello real quick, and then I think Bruno is going to go first. Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Bruno. I'm a technical educator at the Web3 Foundation, and um, I, I'm still learning this stuff as much as anybody else. So please don't, don't find any mistakes that I run into today. Um, I, uh, I joined back in October, and I have, like, I have, I'm, I'm still like absorbing stuff that, that is there. Right now, I'm experimenting with these UI things and trying to get more people to convert to Vue.js from React, um, oh, so that we have some, uh, so that we have some kind of, um, you know, uh, balanced ecosystem because everything's on React. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna try and get some templates going and help people understand how to develop Vue.js stuff with with Substrate chains, and hopefully, it'll pick up soon. Yeah, cool. Sounds good. Alex, do you want to just say, tell us what you're going to talk about briefly and then we'll let Bruno get started? Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Alex Simon, founder of Subsocial. Subsocial is a sort of a mix of Reddit plus uh, Twitter plus Medium features uh, built on Substrate plus uh, IPFS. And today I'm going to show a pass uh, from uh, Polkadot, fork of Polkadot apps JS to our own custom. UI with uh, uh, our palettes and substrate and how we deal with IPFS, so. Yeah, cool, that sounds great. I think IPFS integration is a, a popular topic, so, so looking forward to that for sure. So what I wanna do is I wanna start from a uh, ready-made dashboard, kind of like a template, um, a starter from Creative Tim. This, this guy makes awesome little templates for Vue.js and it's, it's great to start from. So if you want to follow along, you can just um, clone um, later slash, it's going to be um, new white dashboard, I think it's called. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Yes. So it's view white dashboard. And that's kind of like a starter kit where he has defined some, some routes, components, pages and stuff that you're going to see in a bit. So if we go into view demo and then yarn install there. This is going to be uh, over in a, in, a, in a second. You'll see what that looks like and what we'll be editing. So, um, okay, so this, this installed the dependencies now and you can, you can serve this with yarn serve. And it's going to run a development server that just shows you what this looks like when it's built. It's going to throw a lot of errors out um, when it's building this because there are some linting things, nothing uh, logical. It's just um, like um, syntax sugar and layout and stuff. So that's what it's doing here. You can fix that with, by forcing it to, you can see it'll tell you um, uh, that this is potentially fixable with the fix option. You just provide a fix option and it's going to fix these. These are just uh, file format um, formatting in the files. So you can now access this dashboard at localhost 8080 and you basically get this. So this is like, it's, it's not exactly eye candy, but it's, it's good enough. And so this, this guy built this like example dashboard with some components and you can have here the list of all of the supported components like icons. Um, there's a maps embed that doesn't work because I didn't provide my API key. Um, notification examples, you know, stuff like that. So it's kind of, it's kind of like a bootstrap for your, um, see now I went to uh, right to left, let me switch that over. Uh, why? I don't know how to switch it back now. Um, oh yeah, okay. So um, this is kind of like a, like, like a, like your own little bootstrap for building dashboards and UIs for your chain, uh, whatever you want to build. And it's a great starter starter point for an alternative to maybe Polkadot.js apps um, if you want to go that far. But I would actually recommend going, being very specific and building only what you what you need and what you want. So we're going to be editing this and um, adding some Polkadot.js functionality in there. Can you zoom in a little bit? It's, it's a little bit hard to read the text for me. Uh, yeah, but this is not, not really important to see what's what's here. 
So this so is Bruno, just this. This, what, what we have so far. This is like whenever you download this starting place, it looks like this. This is not like data from your chain or something. You're gonna no, no, no. Yeah, this is this is all fake data. This is all just uh, static stuff that's in this dashboard. Um, it's it's not connecting to anything, reading from anything. Um, I mean, it's reading from the JS arrays that he put into the the dashboard. Uh, so it's static static data. It's up to you to replace that with with dynamically generated stuff. So uh, let me just open this folder now, and that's going to be view demo. So uh, first, in order to actually add Polkadot.js stuff in here, we'll have to install this as a prerequisite. So um, and let's add. So we'll add Polkadot API at beta. So we need beta because. Um, At uh, we need beta because that's following master of uh, substrate. Uh, the, the stable versions are, are a little out of date with the recent stuff. So you, you kind of need beta for the latest functionality. So are you, gonna, are you setting up, you're obviously you're adding this Polkadot API dependency to talk to substrate chains and you said beta follows like substrate master. So you're going to run like a substrate chain that's built off of master or something like pretty close to master. I'm going to be querying Kusama here. So oh, it's going to okay. be yeah, yeah, yeah. great. And it's usually pretty close to master. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll also need the utilities. Um, this, you don't need the beta for this because this is kind of just utilities for, for interacting with the data types that you get back or for interacting with the crypto stuff and so on. So now that we have our two dependencies, we're, um, we're happy with that. And um, let's, let's quickly add a new tab into our dashboard. So right now what we have is uh, this, right? We wanna add a new tab here. You can remove those later, but it's good to keep them around to see all of these references, styles and so on. So let's add a new tab or two here to see how, how, we, how easy it is to do that. And then we'll uh, go into com connecting that to Kusama. So the stuff is in pages and you have here, the um, these are all the pages that you can see in the sidebar. Um, so these are the, the components actually. And every component like the icons component is gonna have a little bit of HTML. Um, and then it's going to have the JS. And you can see here that this, um, this data attribute in, in this component returns the list of available icons to the, to the HTML. And in HTML, we have a loop where it loops through the icons and then it just shows them in the dashboard. So these are all the icons that it's looping through and showing. Um, so let's, let's, for example, let's copy this twice. And let's rename one and to say, for you, Bruno. Yep. I'm, I'm a guy who comes from like, as you'd probably call it the dark side where I've done a lot more react development. So is this sure. like console dot view? Is this like the analogous thing to like a react component that you're working yes. on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So view files are view components. They're single files that contain the HTML, the JS and the style for every component that you want to build. Um, generally they should be, um, you know, plug and play. So you should be able to just give somebody your view file and they'll be able to include it in their app. Um, of course, there are caveats to that. If they depend on some other components, then, then you're gonna have to include those as well. But generally they're very portable and, and should work fine. So I made two new components, uh, clones of the icons view file, and I called one council.view and the other one block number.view. So in, in one of them, we're, we're gonna try and get the events about the council and the, in the other, we'll just output some blo a blo the block number or some block information, um, just to prove that our WebSocket connection to Kusama is working uh, across all the components. So the, the goal is to have a WebSocket connection that we don't have to reestablish every time we open a new component. So if we're on this page and I'm connected to, to Kusama and I click on notifications, I don't wanna reestablish the connection and break it from before. I want it to be global and always available like a singleton. So I want the, the connection to stick around and uh, for, my, for my queries to remain fast. Um, this is especially true if I'm connecting to a remote node like um, the, parity the parity hosted or the Web3 Foundation hosted node which is naturally going to be not only slow because everybody's using it but also um, resource restricted, but like through the proxy where they kind of protect against DOS attacks and stuff. So you, you, ideally you would be running your own stuff, right? 
let's uh, now we did what well, we did this, but we are not going to and note that while you're running the app, uh, while you're serving it, it's going to auto reload every time you change something in the in the code. So every time we change stuff, it's going to automatically reload and show us the, the stuff that we did. So um, first, let's um, Let's change. So we added this new stuff. Let's just change the title so we see that it's something different. This one we'll call number. And uh, <laughs> nice editor extension. <laughs> and the council we're going to call the council. All right. So uh, this is just so we see that something's different. Now this is not enough to add them into the sidebar. We also need to modify the. Uh, dashboard layout and the dashboard layout contains the links of the sidebar. You can see here that each template also has the right to left Arabic version. We don't need that. So all we need to do to basically create our links here is copy the sidebar link uh, component uh, invocation twice and uh, we'll change icons to council and one and uh, icons to block number and the other. We can remove all the template mentions actually so that things are a little bit simpler. So template, remove, remove this, remove this. All right, uh, and there's one more thing that we need to do and that's in a uh, router. So in the router, we import all the components that we're gonna need and then we reference them as the routes that we'll have to visit in the browser to, to open those components. So first we'll import the components that we just created. It's gonna be so and number. Uh, so that's going to be council because both of them are in pages. We just go to add pages council, and here we go to add pages. So if you go up here, that's in pages, and not in layout, but in pages, root, block number, and council. This is the same thing here. Um, and now we can use those in the menu. Let's put them under icons. Um, so that's going to be exactly like this. And the path is going to be council. We'll call it. This, this, this is just how the option appears in the, in the sidebar. And the component is going to be. And here we have block num. Uh, now, if we save this, it should already be reloaded and we should be able to see our stuff. There we go. So uh, because I didn't change the icon representing each option, it'll stay with the default that was, uh, that was on the icons thing. But if I go to council, we see now that uh, that our, that the URL doesn't change. Uh, so I must have messed something up, hold on. Oh yeah, I forgot to change it in the dashboard layout. So this is where you also need to change the URL. What should do. So we have icons, we have council, so it says council, and the URL changes to council. And we have block number, changes to block number, block number, and block number in the, in the URL. All right, so we added two new components. We can now edit these and, and play around with them. Um, and that's how, how easy it is to create new pages, new templates in, the, in, in an app like this, in the Vue.js app. Basically, the only thing that would break if you, if you gave this component to somebody else um, is your styling. So because this inherits the styles from the, from the entire dashboard uh, and doesn't have any per component styles um, in the actual component, if you give this to somebody, it's just, it's just gonna look like a naked HTML uh, page, which is also fine, I guess. You don't wanna impose your style on somebody who's trying to use your component in their app. Um, so I guess it's, you know, your mileage may vary on what you prefer there. Um, Okay, so now let's add a global WebSocket connection. Now, um, so rather than fiddle around with the right way to do this in Vue.js, and the right way would be to use some kind of a shared store like Vuex or um, generally using the Vue app because the Vue app is instantiated in uh, app.vue component. So that's the master component which calls in all the other components that need to get rendered. Um, and in main.js, that'll be that'll be summoned and then you'll, you'll, it'll add all of these plugins and then it'll render and mount on an, on an ID in the, in the DOM and so on. So uh, here you would actually add a store which would then get shared across the entire uh, application and then 
every component that's being called upon by the application would would read that store and pull out the information from that store and then save it back in. And then all the other components would also be notified that something changed and so on. But rather than pull in yet another plugin and, and do that the right way, which is uh, uh, quite, quite a bit longer, we can, just, um, we can just rely on good old fashioned JavaScript and some local storage hacks. And um, we'll get that done with simple includes uh, that, that works exactly the same, no, no, no damage. So uh, first we'll add a new file into source. So a new file, and I'm gonna call this like uh, kusama.json because I'm interacting with kusama here. And so you, you need to like, whenever you're, you're building, you're starting out with the polka.js stuff, the, the, the stuff, the start is always the same. And Yako has all of this documented on, um, on polka.js API. But it's um, it's a, for the chat. Yeah, yeah, great. So just uh, check out those docs. But basically, this is a copy paste operation. Every time um, you just add in, you just pull in the um, uh, the, the API promise and the WebSocket provider from um, Polkadot API. Okay. Um, once you get those, you can just um, instantiate the uh, you can just instantiate the WebSocket provider provider to your endpoint. And that endpoint, for now, we're going to put it to a static one like this. This is going to be enough. Um, actually, I like this one. So just put it in, hard code it in. We'll we'll deal with that later, and then we'll just uh, tell the uh, the script to instantiate the um, API with that endpoint, right? So the, uh, with this provider, and now um, we can also expose the. We, we don't actually need the utilities for now. But just um, so now, if we do export. API. What this lets us do is whenever we include this file into any of our components in, in Vue.js, we're immediately going to have access to the API. Um, then now this is still a promise, so it needs to resolve. And we're going to have to resolve that in the components that's, that's, that's requiring it. Um, a, a, a hack on top of this hack is to define the methods that you're going to need in this file and then export those methods so that you can immediately use them in your component. So rather than in your component write uh, something like await uh, API get block hash, something like that, you would actually do all of that in this file and then expose a function called get block hash and you wouldn't have to be, you wouldn't have to deal with the async stuff um, and with the awaits and stuff in your component. You would just call it like get block hash and it's done. But I'll, I'll show you uh, all of that uh, in a second. So now we have this API exposed, and we can call on it in, in any of our uh, in any of our components. And we can we can actually try uh, to see this in action now. Let's modify the the console for now. It's going to be uh, we're just going to brutalize it with some. Uh, actually, let me can I wrap this? Yeah, we're just going to put in some uh, nonsense. So maybe uh, put in something uh, timestamp. So timestamp is a bit of information that we can grab from the chain itself. The chain knows what time it is. And we'll, we'll pull that in. Um, we can remove this loop for icons. We don't need this. Uh, we can remove actually all of this and then just leave it in. So this div is gonna say, oh yeah, actually, it's just, it's just, okay, so now at this point, we'll just import that file. So import API and we import the API uh, variable from the file that we just built earlier. So it's gonna be kusama.js and that's it. You now have access to the API. So uh, we can also delete the icons uh, icons object here, we're not gonna need this. So do we have a very, a much simpler data return? So in Vue.js components, you have this definition of the component here, which uh, keeps all of your 
um, kind of all of your component definitions are here. And now uh, you can, so the data is like um, all the properties of that component. You put them into data and you return them as an object. So now here we're gonna do timestamp zero. So default to value to zero. And it's gonna show as, as this. And we can actually check this out already. If we open the, uh, the dashboard. It's building. So here you go, uh, and you can see that it's defaulting to zero because we said that time, timestamp defaults to zero here. Okay, so we have this, our timestamp is at zero, and now we need to create some, uh, some methods. So methods you define like this, and then there's an object uh, that, is, that, that are these, these methods that you want to, to execute. So for example, get timestamp is gonna be a method and you just give it a body of what you, uh, what you want it to do. And since I told you that, we, that our API that we pull in is, is a promise, then we need to kind of wait for it to resolve. So we have API then. And uh, once that resolves, we'll just have the API. And we now have the resolved API here in the, in the, function, uh, in the function body. So the, the way to get the API timestamp, the chain timestamp is through API uh, query timestamp. And you request now, and this also needs to resolve. When it resolves, it's gonna give us a timestamp and we then set the variable of this component that's called timestamp to this timestamp that we got back. Uh, that's all we need to set the to set the timestamp, but we still need to call the get timestamp function somehow. This could be done with a button in the UI so that when you click it, it just calls a, this function, but it's easier to get it like this. So you have the created method that whatever is defined here is gonna get called when the component is created. Um, and created here means opened in the browser. It doesn't mean first instantiated, it means opened in the browser. So that's just gonna be this get timestamp. And we can actually test this uh, already in the, um, in the UI. And there you go. So this is the current timestamp that's, that's being returned from the chain. And um, it's, um, you know, if you, if you go back and you go back here, it's gonna be different. So this doesn't update it live while you're looking at it because the function wasn't built this way. But when you, navigate away and then back, the created uh, call gets, gets called again. And so the get timestamp function gets called again and it gets the new timestamp. But you can see it's really fast. So the connection stays open. Whenever I navigate away and back, it's, it's already here. The, the zero flash is very short. So you can barely see the zero flash. Um, of course, the, see now, it, it, it all depends on how, many, how much traffic it's getting, how good your bandwidth is on a lot of factors. That's why it's better to uh, run stuff local, but it's generally it stays very fast. So this this was the the timestamp. Now let's let's modify this one a little bit. And I've got a question for you, real quick. Yep. Where did you specify what node you're connecting to? Like I know you said this is some remote node, but I didn't Here. see. Uh, oh, so, yeah, we defined it in the Kusama JS file. We hard coded an endpoint in there. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So let's also do. Uh, the block number thing. Um, it's going to be almost identical to, to what we just did in the um, in the other component. And okay, we can remove also this. We can remove this class, and then we can remove all this. Uh, okay, we don't need this at all, actually. And let's just say uh, block number here as well. And this is gonna be slightly different, but uh, very, very similar. Import API from, again, JS. And even though I'm importing it in this one and in the other component, it's only ever gonna get imported once and it's gonna keep that connection alive. Again, we can delete icons. And our data is going to be number going to be zero, and we'll have methods. That's going to be number. 
All right, so th this is a little, um, it's similar, but it's, it's a little different in terms of what you're fetching. So again, we have, we have to wait for the API to resolve, then we get the API, then we get the body in which we can use the API. That's fine. So uh, now we're calling the RPC method. So here we call the query, which is kind of the query lets you query the chain state, the current state of the chain. But the chain state in, in subtree chains keeps only the necessary information to create new blocks. It doesn't care about past data and past uh, and block numbers are actually past data. Uh, however, you look at it. I mean, you, you do have the last 256 blocks as, uh, the ch as, as part of the chain state. But if you want to go beyond that, it, it belongs in the RPC calls because you're querying historical data. So here we also need to query the historical data, even though we're fetching the current uh, block number, that's just not available through the regular query calls. You have to go through the RPC. So we query the RPC uh, dot chain and you can check out which, like if we, if we go back to, to the uh, subject API, to the apps, you can go to toolbox and in toolbox you have these RPC calls and then you have chain and get block, get block hash, get finals. Okay, let's see get block. And if you don't provide a hash, it'll just default to the latest uh, block. So if you submit this RPC call, you get this latest block that's in the chain. And you can see that the block is, a, a, a J, is, a, is an object, which itself has a property called block and the property called justification. And then that property block has a header, which again has number. So we'll follow that pattern to get to the desired value that we, that we want here. So the, that's actually the easiest way to find out what, what you know, um, what the hierarchy of properties and objects is, because there's very little documentation on, on how these return values actually look. Um, the, that's still something that needs to be done, I guess. So this is like super useful for exploring the, the, the values that you can get out of the system. So we're, we're querying uh, RPC chain, okay, and get block. So we're getting get block, like just, just what I did uh, uh, a second ago in the, in the apps UI. And then again, this needs, to, this needs to resolve. We get this block object, right? And that block object, actually it's, it's kind of not right to call it the block object because we get that, that big object that has both block and justification. So let's just call it result. And again, you get a, okay. Now, uh, in here we get, so since we got result and uh, we need the block number, so we'll set this block number to um, result. And we saw that it's uh, block header number. So we go uh, block header number, but in Polkadot, and now this is like, this is kind of like tip number one is that in Polkadot, you have to, in Polkadot.js API, you have to keep in mind what kind of uh, data you're getting back. Yako tried to emulate the same uh, data types that you're getting, that you're using in Rust in the, the JS. So you're gonna be getting them back encoded and you have to know how to handle each, each type. Luckily, every uh, type that you get back has helper functions attached to it that are uh, too human, too JSON, too number. So two human will turn it into human readable for, for display on the on various dashboards. That's great for text. Uh, two JSON will help you parse them again in some UI components. And two number will just turn it into a number if it if it's not too big to be turned into a number. So we'll, we'll use uh, two uh, we'll use two number here, and that's the function that you need. So now we uh, we also need to kind of make sure that this gets called whenever the component is navigated to. So again, this get block number. Or you could put it into, a, into a, like a manual invocation, doesn't matter. So this, okay, it's built. So block number, and there we go. So the block number is already loaded and we're fetching it from the RPC call. And um, we have one yeah. here, uh, because you, you use from promises and is it possible to use uh, the newest syntax like async await? Yeah, sure, 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 you can. Uh, so you can, you can define this like if you, 
if you do this, th this is what I mean by, you can simplify it by putting all of that async await stuff into this file and then just return the, the end result. It doesn't matter how you write it. I just, um, I just did it here because okay. it's, it's shorter this way. But yeah, you can definitely. Thank you. Yeah, you can also do this like API um, and, and then you can do async function API and then you get this. And then you, you, you have the awaits in here. And yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you can, you can do that, no problem. Um, Jakob, the links we linked earlier, there are examples of doing it with that async await also. Yeah, so correct, correct. Your examples, yeah. I should say, more than anything. Yeah. So uh, in, a, in a nutshell, you can see that, I mean, th these, are all, these are all hacks, but they get the job done, right? It works in the UI. And I guess the, 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 the moral of this short story is uh, he who ships wins. Um, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with the, with the tale of the image tag in browsers, like when, when, the, when the Mosaic browser was still a thing, um, that in the, in the 90s, then Mark Andreessen, um, the same from Andreessen Horowitz, they they were they he it was his browser right it was the most popular browser and he suggested um, there was a limited set like eighteen HTML tags at the time and he suggested a new image tag on the mailing list for the developer for the core devs of the browsers of that of that age and he suggested like I suggest a new new tag image with a, with a single attribute source and a lot of people like complained like even even Tim Berners Lee said like use an existing tag whatever I don't know. Um, then somebody else said, like, why won't you use Im like I-M-A-G-E instead of I-M-G? Like, why would you abbreviate it? And so on. But um, rather than, you know, spend more time debating on the syntax and on the, like, everything else that anybody had to say, they just shipped it, right? It was like their, their I propose a new thing, it was actually just an announcement, hey, guys, we're going to do this no matter what, and it's shipping out with our, in our next release. And before everybody else could agree on what the image tag should look like, they shipped it and it got critical mass before anybody else even, you know, um, realized what was happening. And it, as soon as people realized that they could finally, for the first time ever, embed images directly in HTML text, that was a game changer. And it, it gained so much inertia that the spec, the, 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 you know, the W3 spec actually had to catch up to the image tag rather than the other way around. So the less, the, the moral of the story is just, you know, hack around it, uh, make, make clumsy hacks, like make this type of hack. And, and ship, you can always polish it later if, if uh, you get the inertia that you, that you want it. Otherwise, there's a bunch of people that are gonna beat you to it. Um, so uh, now let's, let's just make sure that, um, so for example, I, I like to run my own stuff. I always run my own nodes. And right now a node is running here, it's idle. It's a full archive node of Kusama. It's running in another tab and uh, it'd be a shame not to use that performance boost when, when I mean, in general, not just when I'm developing. So let's make sure that we can uh, change the uh, node through the UI, similar to how Polkadot.js apps works like. So let's emulate this. That's gonna be also uh, relatively simple in this because at the default, uh, the, the UI, let me just remove this thing. Uh, at the default, uh, the dashboard has this search function, right? It's useless because it doesn't do anything and doesn't react to enter. So you don't actually get anything from it, but it's, the UI elements are there. And again, we can reuse that. We can hack around it to uh, be useful for our, for our use case. So that, and that's what we're gonna do now. So um, we are going to go to top nav bar because that's the top nav bar. And you can follow along by finding the top nav bar file. So if, you, in, if you're using VS Code, you can just also search by just uh, going to the, uh, the master search, touch control shift P and then just delete the function, the function search and you have search by name. So top navbar and um, we'll, we'll modify that. Let me just wrap this, we'll modify that. And let me just remove this because it's in the way. Um, boom, boom, boom. Okay, let's see what we have here. Uh, I'll just zoom out a little bit. Okay, this is way easier to read. So we have a few drop downs here, um, and these drop downs are in fact this. So there are some drop downs that come uh, um, built in with this dashboard. We do not need this drop down, so we can actually we're going to repurpose this one, and let's 
comment this one. This is the profile dropdown. We don't need this. Then we'll do this. Okay, let's do it like this. Let's let's save the endpoint into local storage, and let's pull it from local storage. So first, we'll modify our Kusama JS file so that it. that it pulls the endpoint from local storage, right? Um, if there's no endpoint, because the local storage didn't fetch anything, then we'll set the endpoint to be this, the public endpoint, the default. That's similar to how, how Polkadot.js apps works. And then um, when we do this, we'll also save it Actually, let's let's do this. Let's save it like this. Local storage set item. We'll put it endpoint, and then we'll put uh, the um, endpoint here. Okay. And now we can just fetch the endpoint from local storage here. And by by this point, we're one hundred percent certain that something exists in local storage that'll that'll return endpoint to us. So it's either going to be the default or something that we set elsewhere. Now our connection works with this default, that's good. So let's change this, let's define, uh, let's define a new property called endpoint and let's default that to also that thing. Okay, that's good. Actually, we don't even need to default it to this so that we have less hard-coded values and we can put it default to empty. But then we'll have, uh, we'll have it like this. Computed methods. Okay, let's do this. Let's toggle. We'll provide a value to this function. So something will input and that's either gonna be coming from a dropdown or from a user input like in Polkadot.js apps, right? And then we're going to set the local storage endpoint to that value. And we're also going to um, uh, reload the, the page so that um, our everything refreshes and our connection um, becomes active. So that's that. Oh, and also like if we if we if we choose a drop down and select something that's already selected, we don't want to reload the page for no reason, right? Because it's the same connection that we already had. So if um, uh, endpoint is not the value that's being provided, then do I want to do this? Uh, okay, that looks good. That looks fine. Okay. All right, then uh, 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 let's change. Okay, so this is the search input. We do not need a, we do not need a search bar, search bar, search bar, where are you? Ah, search bar input group, okay. So the search bar input group is not necessary for us. Yeah, so this is not necessary, we don't need this. We also, so this is the input, okay, search model. So when you click the search thingy, you get a pop-up and we want to modify this. So this is bound to search query model. Um, what this means is that it's like, it's a two way bind, like whatever changes in this input field will also apply to this search query property in the, in the component. We don't need this. Um, and this is fine, this is fine, this is fine, this is all good. Okay, the placeholder search we can remove, but we can do this. Um, we can do a V bind and bind it to the placeholder uh, attribute. And then that's gonna be endpoint. So what this does is it uh, sets the placeholder to the value of endpoint. So whatever the value of endpoint in our component is, that's going to be the placeholder. So that when you open that that pop-up, you'll see the currently connected um, node, the, the URL of the node that we're currently connected to. We also need to make sure that this actually reacts to um, 
to the enter key, right? So um, this is done in Vue.js with key up dot enter. That's the same. That's the the simplest way. And then we can move. It, we can tell it to um, other endpoint, and we will send it the value of the current event. So this is going to send the value of this input into the toggle endpoint function that we have on our component when we press enter. That should work. We also need the, uh, the the menu options here. So the menu options here have these. We don't need any of this. We just clone the first one. Uh, okay, let's add some some node addresses. The first one can be our default. That's good. And let's clone this. Uh, let's let's put in the uh, the web three one as well. This one, that's fine. Yes. And let's make it localhost friendly. And we should also make it custom. Okay. Uh, we need to make these links. Uh, do something so you can summon the click to toggle endpoint and provide this same address here. Right. Okay, and this should be, should be fine. So we can do this, this. and uh, okay, this is going to need something else. So we'll put in this one here, and we'll put in this one here. So now, since there's already functionality just to summon the, the search thingy on click, um, this is done through search model visible. So when, and whenever that turns to true, that pop-up is going to show up. So uh, let's go here, and that's going to be on click. Which model visible equals true. We just click that to true whenever you click that. That should do whatever we want it to do. So once we click, this is going to send in the value. This is going to do that. Toggle endpoint, refresh, and I think that's pretty much it. Um, so now we can save, refresh, see if anything breaks. Okay, it's building. Okay, so there we go. We have some nodes listed here now, and I'm currently connected to this based on our previous uh, modification. So if I click on this, it shouldn't reload. It did reload, so something doesn't work here. Let me try again. Ah, this is because we start, uh, no, it's still reloading. All right, let's debug that later for now. We can check if it's going if it's going to connect to um, this one. Okay, uh, we don't know what it's connected to, so let's try and tell it to tell us about it. Um, maybe replace this. This is not notification. This is endpoint, and maybe so. This is the this is the icon, the sound wave. This is this icon. Let's put some value after this. So maybe. A span that contains this value. Let's see what this says. I don't know why it sometimes rebuilds the whole thing and sometimes it doesn't, not sure, but I have to refresh probably. Still not outputting. Hold on. Span endpoint. Custom endpoint. Yeah, this should definitely work. Let me try and put it CSS thing.
So Bruno, just a, a thought to share. We want to be sure we leave enough time for Alex as well. So if Ooh, yeah, it makes okay. sense at some point to like do the debugging afterwards, I can record the addendum and post it in here too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I've uh, completely lost track of time. Okay, let's try something uh, else interesting real quick. Um, basically, this 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 should work probably. Um, we are connecting to the thing that we want. Actually, we can check this out in the local storage. Um, storage, get item, and yeah. So we are connected to the Web3 thing. Uh, there you go. It does work, it's just not displaying it here. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure why. We can look into that later. Mm. Another idea for testing is we could connect to your local node and then you could kill that node and see if it, you know, reflects the fact that the endpoint went down. Yeah, so now, right now there's no error, uh, error handling here. So uh, I don't know what's gonna happen, let's try it out. So connect locally. Let's see if that works. Yep, all right, now let's kill the node. All right, there we go. Immediately got it disconnected, and it's throwing errors because it can't um, it can't find the WebSocket connection anymore. If we try to switch, it's going to be stuck at zero. So it's going to be stuck at the default value of the component that we originally set. As soon as I get the node back up, there we go. We're back. So oh, nice. So that seems like everything worked except displaying the text by the sound wave, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably a CSS issue with, that I have to look into. Um, okay, so we're, we're kind of out of time, but I wanted to show you um, how we can, I, I'm, I'd be happy to continue this in an, like an like a off-chain off um, <laughs> tutorial. Um, I wanted to show you how to fetch, how to subscribe to events that are happening and output them in the page. It's, it's equally simple. It's just like it's 10 lines of code. Um, but then there's, there's this interesting problem that I ran into that I didn't have time to demonstrate, and that's, when you, want, when you want to fetch historic events. So the point of this was to actually get to a state where you could output the activity of council members in the democracy and see who was active when and on what. So that if a council member has never voted on a proposal, obviously that's a red, red flag for that council member. Uh, so the way you do that is you fetch historic events, events from the past of the chain. And the Polkadot.js API has a very interesting, very cool um, API thing for that that goes something like this. So you get like API query system events, and then you go range, and then you provide a range of headers. So you get a um, start header and you get a end header. If you don't provide an end header, it's just like it goes uh, for as long as there are headers. So it goes forever. Um, and in that range, it will, it will grab all of the events from the blocks that you can that you can find, and that sounds great, right? But we've had numerous runtime upgrades in that range, and in those runtime upgrades, the types and the metadata of the chain has changed. So now the range breaks from from uh, last Monday. The range breaks because the types are different than they were before, and now what you have to do to get historic events from a specific range that spans over a runtime upgrade is you have to uh, check what range you're dealing with, make sure that in that range there was no runtime upgrade. And if there was, you have to break your range into that, into those sections by runtime upgrades, however many there were. And then you need to fetch the metadata for that section, apply the types of that metadata to that range, grab the events from that range, then do the same thing for every single sub range that you determined and then in the end merge the result and return it back out. And that's a super complicated thing that is actually very handy as a uh, custom function developed in, in Vue or in general in JS as a helper method that lets you kind of uh, query historic events in one go without having to do, do this whole dance. And I wanted to demonstrate that, um, but we ran out of time, but I, I do hope that this was kind of interesting enough to get you like at least interested in, in playing with it. 
uh, feel free to use the the dashboard that I linked to that and that that Joshi put the link to in chat. Though I will be publishing a, a starter kit with the with the JS stuff built into the dashboard soon and and with the extra stuff stripped out so that you can get started developing on this uh, right away and that you can use and well I guess we'll follow up in a in a new tutorial on yeah how we're to looking forward to that, that Bert. like I feel like we learned a ton today and uh, it sounds like you have a, a lot more to teach so yeah whenever you write it up or record it just you know let us know and if it's soon I'll edit it into this video you know and if not we can just post it in this seminar channel very helpful cool. thank you okay thank you thank you okay that's it for me thanks guys. Cool. Yeah, good to see you here, Bruno. Um, okay, cool. So I guess next we have uh, Alex, and Alex, you're going to tell us about uh, subsocial and some the UI, and I'll I'll let you uh, put it in your own words. Yeah. Okay. So at subsocial, we work as uh, both uh, substrate, um, runtime palettes, and UI, and also connect somehow uh, IPFS to all this uh, stuff, and uh, also we have chain things but uh, we're still not using uh, we're not using uh, chain workers yet because it started with simpler uh, implementation based on um, javascript and by chain means that uh, we have been, for example feeds and notifications for users uh, based on personalized subscriptions so um let me check uh, so I, I need help uh, of my colleague vlad uh, he's going to um, share screen and we would like to show you a UI uh, walkthrough with uh, IPFS cluster so last week we worked on a connecting IPFS cluster and um, now um, so uh, what is the idea is um, every node that has a substrate um, that person can uh, run IPFS uh, node and um, it could be connected, subscribed to cluster at least. It can replicate the state of the of chain. And um, also every node can build uh, feeds and notifications for users or for example, for themselves. For example, you want to build your feed uh, on your own and uh, also you can run Elasticsearch to, for full text search operations. So it's like a um, uh, constructor. You can choose what parts of subsocial you want to run. And uh, for you is a substrate node, um, IPFS cluster, and then uh, Elasticsearch and Postgres with feeds and notifications. So now we can see UI and uh, let's uh, create log in with uh, Polkadot extension. So it's, uh, it's uh, Vlad already, uh, Maybe you can maybe you can open in uh, another browser and uh, show this confirmation window with Polkadot extension. So this UI we're looking at, or that we were just looking at, that's like if you know that's the main interface to the social network, I guess, right? And you guys wrote that. Yes, yes. So first we started uh, with uh, playing around in a fork of Polkadot apps JS. So we just uh, forked the source code and uh, we started to create uh, custom components inside of it uh, to our palettes. And then uh, once we had something functional from uh, uh, st start to finish, we decided to extract it to a custom uh, uh, application. And so here you can see this uh, confirmation window of uh, Polkadot extension. Yeah, so once you allow access to the have inside of yeah. yeah, choose what account you want to deal with uh, application, with DAP. I can see that you have uh, two accounts. Um, yeah, and uh, so this is our second version of application. I mean, second and the, and the current. And uh, we decided to go with Next.js. Uh, JS slash uh, React web framework. It uh, supports universal rendering. So it means that uh, with some approach, we can have server-side rendering. And this is required for 
social networks, uh, social media, uh, so to be indexed by search engine bots. And also, uh, we decided to go with uh, uh, UI components from, it's called uh, Undesign. And um, yeah, so let's, let's start with creating a blog. Maybe, what can, can you please create a blog, uh, Substrate Seminar? Yeah, really, the more people that blog about seminar, the better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, currently, the, the launch, it's, it's, it's uh, sort of uh, uh, AlphaNet. And uh, later this month, we're going to launch BetaNet. And um, still, we're working on uh, refactoring our commenting system a little bit. And later, I will show you uh, what is the... Um, specific things about uh, um, blogs and posts and from substrate perspective. Yeah, so you can use uh, markdown here in description and currently you can specify image by URL only, but later we'll introduce another improved editor. So you'll be able to upload images to APFS. And also you can use tags here. Yeah, so uh, idea is that uh, you can use text, for example, to build your custom menu. For, ex for example, you can create a tag post with uh, something like validators or console or a friend, etc. And then via custom uh, per blog menu, you can uh, go to different posts uh, so they will be filtered by these tags. Uh, wait, what? Uh, can you please show uh, a cluster, IPFS cluster? Yeah, so here is our IPFS cluster with our node connected. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, node UI. So it's, uh, this node UI is connected to cluster. And uh, what do we have in this uh, file? Yeah, so uh, such as we started to edit a blog and created this uh, confirmation model before. Uh, once this confirmation model showed, uh, we store data in APFS. And uh, when we click uh, Sign Submit, the data goes uh, to Substrate. So we create an object for the structure of log. Let's hit this button. And on Success, we get an event, uh, block created, and we have this uh, new ID. You can see this ID in URL, block slash ID. And then we get this APFS hash from the previous tab and it gets stored uh, along with this uh, block structure. So first we store an APFS, we receive APFS hash and then uh, when sending transaction, we already need this APFS hash not to create two transactions, right? So we want to in one transaction send already APFS hash. So, so the workflow there was like you, you type up the blog and you click the, like, I forget what it said, but like the post button or something. And that actually publishes it to IPFS immediately. Yes, yes. And then it prompts you like, you know, submit this transaction on chain so that the chain knows about like the correct IPFS hash. Yeah, so currently in this way, it could be some garbage a little bit uh, and it could be improved. Uh, currently we clean it uh, if you click cancel button on creating a blog or post or something. Uh, Vlad, can you please open also our apps? So yeah, actually we have us uh, Polkadot apps, we are running them uh, and with our types. So you can go to advanced tab and see all the content and extrinsics yes, with Polkadot.js apps. So you just click on this advanced and we are running it on the same port. So they share the same local storage. So UI and apps uh, share the same local storage. So we can create accounts and everything from the apps. It will be visible in uh, apps at the same time. So we're switching to our node here. So the, the advanced tab on your UI launched an instance of Polkadot apps? Yes, exactly, with our types. So at some point we just uh, grabbed the fresh version of Polkadot.js uh, apps and added our types and uh, added our node here. So just go to storage and show how this uh, blog look like, looks like. So do you maintain a fork of the apps UI that has your types coded into it or they're like injected at runtime or how does that work? Uh, sorry, can you put it again? 
Yeah, do, do you maintain a fork of the apps UI that has your types in the code or you yes, just- Yes, yes, so we maintain it and I can share a link to it in a second. The chain, chain state. Oh yeah, we can see it. Yes, please just uh, show this. Yes, so let's go to, uh, we have our palette, it's called social. We can get a block by ID. Yeah, so this is uh, um, information about block and uh, the last uh, field, it's uh, IPFS hash. You can see this is a hash that uh, contains that is saved. So has any of the stuff we've seen required tokens? Do Like if I wanted to mess around with your social network, do I need to get a token balance or anything? Uh, yeah, you need token uh, and uh, this week we're going to launch a uh, faucet for this. But uh, we didn't work uh, on tokenomics yet because uh, uh, yeah, in 2017, 18, a lot of projects showed uh, that they're not capable of creating something usable and people aren't going to use token here and there. And uh, there was no mass adoption at all for, for tokens. So I'm not high with this uh, ideas for token, uh, tokenomics. I have something on mind and uh, if somebody is interested, I would be happy to discuss uh, the ideas that I have. And the current uh, thing that I thinking about is to subsidize users, uh, but um, yeah, hey, actually, I asked this question on uh, the last uh, Sub Zero conference online about how they see this uh, sub subsidiary of uh, user actions. But the main question here is Sybil uh, attack. So, if you have a smooth uh, way to validate accounts, so to prevent Sybil attack, then we can subsidize uh, accounts with tokens and, for example, based on their reputation in the community, etc. But the main question is how to uh, verify accounts, sort of KYC or, I don't know, social um, validation, maybe some sort of uh, simplified validation via uh, tweet or gist on GitHub, like uh, you, have, you, you may be seen it on uh, uh, Keybase, yeah. So you can validate your account uh, of Keybase via gist on GitHub or tweet or etc. So I, I have been thinking about these ideas and then uh, also, I'm thinking about some sort of uh, token, uh, like special token for social actions, uh, and that could be, the tokens could be uh, issued or make make made available per every account, maybe like once per week, so we can create uh, this certain number of uh, actions, like posts and comments and upvotes. Let's say I don't know, like uh, five posts maximum per day and. 20 or 50 comments per day and uh, 50 votes, something like this. And then if you want to uh, broader brand widths, maybe you want to buy these uh, tokens. But uh, the main idea is that uh, this token should not be tradable. So they should be um, uh, earned by zero activity or there should be some automatic value, like some, some sort of basic income, actually. I'm thinking about these ideas. Okay, so um, let's create a post. So this post, you also can use markdown here and tags. Uh, and the idea is that uh, you can use tags for both uh, blogs and posts. So later on, we'll show you how you, the stuff could be uh, searchable by tags. Yeah, and also we have this scene, uh, it's in advanced tab actually, a little bit below. Uh, can you can you cancel this? Yeah, there is advanced the uh, section below. Low, wait, wait, below on this same screen. And the thing is uh, that, uh, for example, you want to cross post from your medium or from Steemit, and you want to specify our original URL of article. Uh, so Google will not uh, make a pen penalty to this post. So this is the idea of this original post. It's uh, if some somebody is. Uh, Familiar with uh, SEO, uh, uh, it's called uh, Unical URL. Okay, so let's create a post. And also, I'm thinking about uh, creating some sort of uh, session keys. 
And the idea is that uh, this session key, you will not be required to enter your password every time. So how I see it, uh, you go to UI, you click login, and then uh, on this login, you will sign uh, start a session extrinsic. And with this start, start a session, a uh, new session key, a key pair will be generated and put into local storage and optionally uh, protected with password or maybe even not uh, doesn't have a password for smoother experience. And then the session key will be added to your uh, profile on uh, Substrate. And then you will be click clicking on all this uh, uploads, posts, comments uh, without, without even uh, this confirmation window. Uh, yeah, it, it would be great to hear feedback on this. That's an interesting idea even beyond like, you know, your specific application here. You know, if you're using any DAP for a period yeah. of time, you're submitting it, signing each transaction individually. And like, I mean, yeah, sometimes that's good and, and critical definitely for like token transfers and stuff. But yeah, for something like this, it seems like a, a good idea to be able to make it work more like regular, you know, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, whatever. Yeah, so uh, exactly. Uh, idea is to bring a uh, smooth experience and uh, for such uh, actions like create a post, comment, or uh, upload. Uh, from some, from one side, it's uh, important for users, it's their stuff, but from the other side, it's, uh, mm, it's not financial uh, operations. I mean, maybe there will be some payments uh, later on, but uh, currently it's not so important from financial perspective and uh, why not to make it uh, less secure? And uh, we can also play around with uh, adding password to this or even not adding password. So for example, if you start the session, you create a session key pair on this local device on this exact browser or uh, whatever uh, software you use, maybe Electron and then uh, you will not be able, you, you will not be even asked about password. So we'll just click around and everything will be sent uh, smoothly. So yeah, if you go to IPFS again, so that's like kind of a similar idea to a burner wallet where like, yeah, we'll keep our keys in local storage and yeah, that's not what you want to do if they control 10 Bitcoin or something, but mm -hmm. like, you know, a usability trade off. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this ideas could be improved later on uh, with setting some um, restrictions or settings like, for example, don't bother me about, uh, I don't know, like five posts per day or 20 comments per day. But if I want to, do I don't know more than 50 comments or like 1000 comments or 1 million comments maybe you want to be asked about your password or mm, your session key should be expired or you want to introduce something like remember me in uh, web 2.0 but uh, with different parameters like expire after uh, current session like 30 minutes expire in one day in one week in one month and then with drop down you just select how long period you want your session key uh, stored and expired in the substrate. Yeah, so now we have this uh, three uh, content files for blog, for post, and... Uh, it, it actually should be two of them uh, because we can sealed one post uh, and uh, we found a bug uh, like uh, when blog is unpinned when we uh, press cancel button, but not a post. But yeah, so it should be two of them. Yeah, that's interesting. So like the one you started to write a blog and like clicked the first submit or whatever, but then you didn't send the transaction to substrate. So I guess like we can still see it here in IPFS, but not on chain. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it's uh, not stored on chain. Uh, and um, so if you, if you cancel this confirmation window, we're not sending transaction to create a post on chain. But uh, we store content on IPFS because before sending transaction, we need to know this uh, IPFS uh, hash. And uh, in that case, when you click uh, cancel, um, the unpin operation sent to our off-chain node and it should an unpin content. But it will be garbage collector collected later on. So for some, for some reason, it stores a little bit for some time. Even if you un unpin, it's available. Um, okay, so uh, let, let's show this custom uh, navigation bar for blog, Vlad. So in, in, in Subsocial, you can create a custom menu for 
variable log, if you click on blog that we created, substrate seminar. If you're an owner, yeah, let's switch to owner. Okay, so we're owner and you can click uh, edit menu on uh, left corner. And with edit menu, you can create a custom menu like on uh, medium. For example, let's create menu uh, substrate and uh, specify URL uh, to substrate actually. Yeah, you can, you can specify di a different type of contents. Currently we support uh, content by URL. It's like, it could, could be outer URL, it could be internal URL and by tag. Yeah, exactly. And please create another one right here. Uh, for for the tags that you used before, what kind of tag you used? So we can specify tag, and you can specify a list of tags, and also you can have description. You can reorder them on the right side. Yeah, so we have markdown everywhere on the dis for descriptions. And please uh, show the reordering of uh, tags on the right. Yeah, you can drag and drop the stuff and even uh, disable. Okay, so let's create this tags, add tabs. So nothing's happening on chain here, right? This is like customizing my local view uh, or the way- Yeah, so there. for example, some, some stuff we just uh, save in APFS. So if you click create this menu, it will be stored in APFS only because uh, in blockchain we store things that uh, uh, make impact on logic, uh, what we do. And for example, you, you, you can even think that uh, in some situations, maybe upvotes could be stored off chain, maybe sharing of posts could be stored on chain. But uh, then if you think about rewards and you want to incentivize people uh, for some posts, for example, you want to run contents, uh, co contests, and maybe you want to use uh, smart contracts. So you want to let your uh, blog owners to create the contents, contests uh, that uh, will incentivize, let's say 10 dots per week for three most upvoted or shared or something, some other custom formula. So by some custom formula in smart contract, you can uh, calculate uh, the popularity or trendiness of the posts uh, within a blog. And in this way, you can incentivize people to share cool, cool stuff in your blog or you can think about any other contests. So for this contest, uh, it's obviously you need uh, this data in, in chain inside, but I cannot think about any uh, reason to have this uh, menu inside of blockchain. So we store it in APFS. Can, can you maybe show uh, this uh, menu in APFS? If, if, if you click on the uh, content of blog. Can you uh, explain what, what you mean? Yes, just click on the uh, content the menu added. Just go to APFS node tab and click on blog. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, um, I, need, I think you need to update it. It's an old one. Here's a new version of it. Ah, yeah, exactly. So uh, such as APFS is immutable, uh, we created another uh, entry for this. And now we can, we can see that uh, see we have the snap tabs. It's the first item in the list. And it has title, type of content, description, etc. Okay, so it's fine. And let's, uh, let's go to this, that uh, navigation and show how we can see content by tag. If you go, if you click on uh, uh, blockchain, yes. So you click on uh, this custom uh, menu item and you can see- Maybe, maybe I forgot uh, to sorted by blockchain. Okay. Yeah, I think you specified another tags. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here is a cool tag. Yeah. Actually, we can edit it. Okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's show this. So just, just add another tag here. You, you can just add another tag. Yeah. So you can specify a number of tags and uh, it will perform full text search by tags over the content.
Wait, do you have Elasticsearch running? Yeah, just uh, sub uh, substrate node. Uh, oh yeah, node. now it's appeared. I think it's uh, lagging because of uh, Zoom. So yeah, yeah now you can see that uh, we, we filtered force by tags. On that in the URL, we can see tags uh, equal and so on. Yeah, okay, so in this way we showed that we have uh, APFS, uh, we have uh, Elasticsearch, so we can perform full text search. And if you type uh, substrate in the search bar and hit the enter, so you can search by title, by description of blog, post, uh, et cetera. And you can, you can filter through all the content stuff like blogs and posts. You can go to blogs exactly or posts and so on. And also um, we have this feed and notifications uh, for every account if you follow the blog. So if you, if you switch uh, uh, to another account, and create a comment on the post you own, you should see this notification. So now we're following the blog and let's go to post and write a comment. We should write it from Alice or Bob? Uh, from not owner. Not so owner. from the owner, we should see that uh, your post is commented. And let's switch to another account to see this notification to owner. Yeah, so we can see that another guy has commented our post. It's a first not notification list. And um, yeah, we, can, we have uh, also optional profiles. If you go to account, please click on account. Yeah. Um, yeah, so such as you're not an owner, uh, maybe you go to profile from side menu. Or from here. So optionally you can create your profile and uh, in the similar way to create a blog or a post, you can specify uh, your biography and social links and uh, full name, username, etc. So a lot of different stuff over here. Okay, so uh, we showed you uh, Next.js and um, full text search and cluster and feed. And also a couple of words about uh, off-chain application. Um, one second. Maybe I will share my screen. Vlad, thank you very much. I will switch to my screen. You're welcome. So here we have... Uh, different applications and in short our main applications are first is node uh, it, it is it will be updated soon there is a second version so for the second version uh, that we already use but it's not merged yet in our main repo this is uh, the code where is chat ah, and actually it's under this branch. So there is branch where we refactored comments. So first we created the separate structures. One is for blog, another for post, another for comment. But then I figured out that uh, post and comment share the same uh, functionality. So we re-implemented the uh, comments via post. So now post has extension. So there is such field as extension. Seconds. And let's see. So this is our huge uh, palette that we're going to split soon. And the structure for post. Utility field for created updated to see who created and updated this stuff. And they would just store uh, three fields, account, block number and time. So this goes to every 
in every structure in blog and po in post we have this created and updated updated is optional so to keep track uh, who created when who updated when then we have this hidden field uh, it's sort of replacement for delete operations because this uh, substrate it's quite hard to delete the stuff to clean everywhere uh, here and there because uh, it's not a relational database and you need to delete carefully so we haven't implemented delete operations did so we just uh, added hidden fields and the idea behind hidden is just to respect the will of the author and not to show this on on ui so this is a, a shortcut and then I mean, really that's all there is anyway like even if you delete a facebook post you know sure maybe facebook you know even if they delete it the way they say they do like it could be archived on the web or something so like i think what you're getting at is sort of a, a fundamental thing here you know once somebody has seen you sign a blog post then yeah you can take it out of the ui but you can't like really revoke that signature or anything yeah exactly i remember once uh, i read about uh, approach with uh, Vkontakte, it's Russian clone of Facebook. And I read that uh, they just have this field uh, that is called sort of a deleted uh, Boolean. And they don't delete the stuff because uh, in databases and if they use uh, especially uh, HDD as a storage, uh, it's very cheap operation to mark uh, something deleted without uh, all this uh, shifting data uh, to clean up uh, empty spaces between data so they didn't uh, delete the stuff uh, explicitly they just mark it so we have this thing called the extension and for example for post we have a couple of extensions and what does it mean so we have reg regular post and we have comment uh, for comment uh, this is a num with a uh, struct inside and comment have parent id and root post id Root post ID is the post uh, that in, in a root, like as a main uh, topic uh, around what we have these discussions and comments. And parent ID is uh, any other post uh, that this comment is an answer to. So next things we have, it's uh, IPFS hash. So it's uh, self-explanatory and the history of uh, previous uh, changes to the post. For example, in the post history record, we have uh, the guy who uh, edited and what and, and, and what block and also post update and with post update uh, you see that we have IP, previous IPFS hash and other optional fields so everything is optional and this way we just save a little bit of data so um, but when you when you make an update to post a block uh, at least one of the fields should be um, some then we have statistics information uh, for shares for posts and votes, and we have score. So score is uh, changed uh, when somebody is up upvoted or downvoted your post. And for scores, uh, we have run. Okay. So we have different weight per every action. Um, for example, for Upvoted and vote, we have different uh, score, and we multiply that score with uh, a logarithm of uh, current reputation of a user, and then we add this uh, score to the post. So in this way, we have this uh, score updated and for blog. But uh, we're going to refactor this stuff a little bit uh, to support uh, tags. So we want to have. So before I showed that we have tags in IPFS, but we're going to introduce tags in a blockchain uh, for the reason that we want to have this uh, scores to participate in logic. And the idea to have a user reputation split by tags. For example, if you write posts on substrate on blockchain and you have a lot of posts, uh, your score in this IPFS in, in substrate and the blockchain will be high. And if you don't uh, understand about uh, arts or sports and you write some post nobody upvoting you you will have a small score so this is uh, some sort of what we are planning to do and uh, yeah so we have this weights uh, for every action it's uh, and you can see that uh, every action like follow blog uh, upload post download post and they have separate uh, weight 
And for example, we separated a voting and voting post from uh, a voting and voting comment because uh, to write post uh, requires more work and to write comment less. So uh, post could, should be appreciated more than posts, as in comments with upvotes and downvotes. So this is the idea. But it's up for the people who run the node. They can change it or maybe it could be changed by governance. Like, well, it's, it's not it's up to individual node operators, I think, right? It's up to like the, the network as a whole and whatever kind of governance they have. Yes, yes, for the network as a whole and governance. So if we connect the uh, governance here, like in Kusama, this uh, parameters can be tuned later by community, yeah. for example. Nice. Yeah. This, this is an extensive uh, social network you've built here. I love the IPFS tie-in. Hernando was asking something about Filecoin earlier. I'm just curious if you guys have any plans to ever integrate with that or use it. Um, I, haven't, I haven't checked uh, Filecoin. And I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what is the status of it. I, I saw that they launched Testnet, um, but I don't know. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that uh, it will work uh, as it is because uh, from what I understand, uh, you need to pay for every storage. But uh, in social networks, people don't want to pay for storing even one character, one post. <laughs> they don't want to pay. And I don't know. Uh, I have some ideas that uh, maybe you can uh, go to settings and specify what storage you want to use uh, for your posts. For example, you want specify storage uh, like uh, built on that, that is jo Joshua working on. Yeah. Maybe you want to specify even uh, your private uh, database like Postgres. For example, I have plans to, so currently we have this IPFS hash field, where is it? Yeah, so currently we have this APFS hash field, uh, but uh, what I want to do is to create here a num and you will specify either APFS hash or dot ID or even a name of your database with a table with a ID. And in this way you can uh, refer to a row in the table of your private database. Uh, do, do you understand what I mean with this? I, yeah, I definitely get the idea of like storing, choosing where to store your data. Yeah. So we just started with APFS and then we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, let me see what I wanted to show again also. Um, yeah, so another one cool scene, maybe last one. Um, so today I described uh, the palette that we want to work uh, this week and next week. It's called roles. And it's mainly um, influenced by uh, what we have on Discord, for example. And the idea is that uh, you, you can have a num with permissions, what can be done on network, like creating post, editing your own post or others posts, vote, upvote, and moderate comments, and so on. And then you can, uh, you should be able to create a role uh, this ID and attach it to space. Space is a synonym to blogs and profiles. And then you specify a set of permissions that you want to allow to this role. And disable this sort of like uh, delete. Uh, so you can enable disable role without deleting it. And then uh, we have this uh, storage where you specify uh, what roles are in this exact blog, for example. And then uh, we have this uh, thing called actor. And actor could have two states. First is uh, account ID and another is space. So the space could act like a profile. And the thing that is different from social networks is on the social network, you can have uh, one profile per one email. But in our case, uh, one account address can have many profiles and one profile could be owned by uh, many different accounts. For example, like in situation with recovery addresses or in situation with uh, session keys, you need to be able to co-own uh, one profile from different account addresses. So for this season, we decided to go with actor. And when creating a role, uh, like uh, uh, here, you can specify, uh, so this actor 
uh, acts uh, in this space um, on the, with these roles uh, using table map. So by uh, actor, like account ID, you can see what roles uh, he or she has uh, in this exact space. So this is the idea. And uh, of course, we're going to have this uh, uh, extrinsics like create role, update role, and then get grant role to list of actors, revoke role from, this, from another list of actors, and disable enable. So this is this thing that we want to introduce. And uh, one of the main reasons for this is, for example, uh, we could create uh, different blocks for teams that don't want to bother with subsocial for first time, but they want to uh, start some some easy start and we can create a assistant role. So assist, assistant will be able to post uh, to their blogs, but uh, will not be able to edit other posts or edit comments and so on. So with roles, we can uh, think about different use cases and scenarios and permissions. So that's it, I guess, because uh, it could last forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Well, thanks a lot for showing off SubSocial. I'll look forward to playing around with it. Yeah, and uh, thanks a lot everybody for, for coming today, um, especially Alex and Vlad for showing your work with SubSocial and also for Bruno for showing us how to work with, uh, with Vue.js. It was good to see you guys all here again. Yeah, thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you.